Hello, I'm Ray Pierre Humbert. I'm I'm the Halley Professor of Physics, and I'm coming to you live from Oxford, England. I, and uh, some ten years ago, I wrote a book called Principles of Planetary Climate, or that's when it was published, when it became available. Uh, and there have been some really breathtaking developments in planetary science uh, since that time. And I've begun working on a second edition, or actually I'm about midway through a uh, second edition. I wanted to share with you uh, some of these new developments and, and some of my plans for, for the second edition. So I'll just share my screen uh, so that you can see some of these graphics. So, uh, so now you should be seeing my, uh, uh, you should be seeing uh, my slides. Uh, it says principles of planetary climate. Okay, so uh, let me take you back to uh, let me let me take you back to where I started some uh, some years ago. Uh, at the time I started writing this book, and it took take me about it took me about five years really to write it. Partly because I was writing about a lot of things I wanted to learn myself, and so uh, there was a lot of distillation of the literature and teaching myself. And one of the advantages of writing about things that you've recently learned is that you haven't become an expert yet, so you remember what was hard to learn. But what prompted me to write this book was that uh, over, over my career, there had been really uh, breathtaking developments in, in several different areas related to how planets work. Uh, the developments in understanding uh, the past climates of Earth, uh, Earth paleoclimate, uh, and the early Earth, say Earth billions of years ago, and phenomenon, phenomena such as snowball Earth, which happened uh, several times in Earth's pa distant past when, when the temperature regulation mechanisms for Earth broke down and, uh, and the, uh, the whole Earth froze over all the way to the equator. This happened once. 600 or 700 million years ago, and another time about two and a half billion years ago. Uh, there bit, were uh, just uh, amazing and ongoing amazing uh, uh, d uh, discoveries that came from solar system exploration from robotic probes uh, and so forth. And probably the biggest development, something I never thought to see during my career, uh, was not only the discovery of exoplanets, which are planets around uh, around other stars, uh, but, but the ability Ability to say quite a lot uh, about what they're like from astronomical observations. It opens up a whole new set of challenges for, for climate modeling. And of course, uh, all of the same physics, the basic principles, physical principles that go into determining the climate of the planet, the, these are the sort of principles that we use for, uh, for understanding our own human impacts on the, Earth's, on the Earth's climate, global warming, the way that emission of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases uh, affects the temperature of our, of our own planet. So all of these climate phenomena rest on the same fundamental physical principles. The basic building blocks are thermodynamics, radiative transfer, and fluid dynamics uh, that put, are put together in various combinations. But to exploit the synergies and be prepared to address uh, the new challenges by all of these new observations. It, you need a generalized approach uh, to climate that's based on emergent climate phenomena. That's the fundamental underlying physics has been known for a long time, but when you put simple physical building blocks together, uh, they give you uh, emergent phenomena. The behavior of the collective system can, can do, can do uh, surprising things, but they all arise from the same basic principles. And they play play out in different way on in a different in different ways on on different planets. So the the guiding principles that uh, the, the guiding principles uh, that I kept in mind when when writing this writing this book are that uh, the 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 physics should be presented with no earth centric preconceptions. For example, uh, we, uh, on the on the Earth, uh, what rains or snows is condensed water. Uh, but uh, but the general phenomena, the way that condensation affects the climate, is pretty uh, is pretty universal uh, uh, to uh, anything that might be changing phase, anything that might be condensing, with just some changes of the constants. So when we talk about things like uh, what determines rainfall rates or snowfall rates, there's no real need to make special assumptions about uh, the condensate being water. 
uh, the condenser could be methane, which is the case on, on Titan, or on some of the new planets that I'm working on, the condensate is beach sand, silicon dioxide, or even more, more uh, poetically, uh, there, uh, there's even, there are even clouds that are made out of sapphires, although they're not actually blue sapphires, they're rather dirty looking yellowish sapphires. We need a holistic, uh, and I realize we needed a holistic approach to atmosphere because an atmosphere can't be considered in isolation. An atmosphere is a very dy dynamic entity. Uh, it's continually exchanging uh, with the crust of a planet and the interior of the planet. Um, and uh, also it's evolving by uh, a leakage to space. And uh, the, these things are, are essential to, these things which impinge on both geology and space science uh, really, really uh, are uh, are essential to understanding how planets evolve over time. In fact, uh, they they, as I point out in the book, they're really uh, essential. These geological things are part and parcel of what determines uh, whether a planet is is habitable or not, and how long it remains habitable. And the third central pillar uh, was what I call freedom to tinker. Uh, that all, all results presented in the book uh, should be reproducible by the reader. Uh, that is, I was not willing to just reproduce any graphs from someone else's paper. Uh, I w every result that's in there uh, will be uh, should be reproducible uh, using software that I uh, that I distribute as as an accompaniment to the book, uh, and using data sets that I that I provided. Uh, and the idea was that the software should not just sort of statically reproduce the the uh, uh, the graphics in the book, but rather should provide a client a toolkit. Uh, that can be uh, used not only to reproduce what's in the book, but to allow the readers to perform their own explorations. And in many cases, uh, over the 10 years that the book has been around, uh, these basic tools have expanded into, into uh, papers and research projects by students, postdocs, other faculty members. And, and, uh, uh, and a great deal of original research has, has had its origin in the simple tools that I provided. And I, I um, implemented this uh, via uh, the Python language, and I'll get to some new developments in the Python language, uh, in the Python language shortly. Uh, there is a website associated with the book and a Twitter and a Twitter feed, um, and um, the uh, uh, um, oh yes, I forgot, I, I do want to mention one, one other thing. The the uh, uh, the the uh, dedication of the book is dedicated to Arnold E. Ross, uh, who was a mathematician at Ohio State University. Uh, and um, he he had he taught a, a program in number theory to high school students, which was a great influence on my on me and my thinking about science. But he had the saying, "Think deeply of simple things," and that's been a kind of an overarching guiding principle to all of my research, but all, all but in particular to the book. Uh, number theory is is a, is a part of mathematics where where with just using basic arithmetic you can pose very challenging questions, things like Fermat's last theorem, which took uh, centuries to prove. Uh, uh, so you can, you can uh, you, by thinking about simple things, you, you get great profound insights. And, and my, uh, my conception, my philosophy of climate science is that, is that big ideas come from simple models, uh, not, uh, and eventually there's a role for the more complicated models that you need to run on supercomputers. But my, my, um, my emphasis in writing this book is to, is to teach people how to write simple models uh, that they can explore and understand using mathematics uh, very, very centrally. Uh, and number theory, I really love. It's one of my main subjects. But there's not any, uh, except for one little remark about the uh, uh, about uh, Bernoulli numbers. There's no number theory in in my book here. Okay, there's um, now um, there there is a website where you can go to for uh, updates, and I will be uh, uh, posting some of the new courseware over the course of the coming coming year, so you can start using some of it before the second edition is ready and. Uh, uh, it will, don't hold your breath, it's still going to take about two years for me to finish work on the second edition, uh, but, uh, but I will be providing some glimpses uh, in, in advance uh, so, you can see, so you can see what's coming and start working with some of the new things. And there is a Twitter feed, uh, which I use for, uh, uh, originally used just for pushing out information about the book, updates, and related events, lectures, and so forth, but it's expanded to my general Twitter feed with musings about 
all sorts of things. And so I invite you to follow me there uh, if you want to um, keep, uh, if you want to know about my my uh, my general activities and things I've been thinking of. So, okay. Um, okay. So what are the new things since the first edition? Well, for one, uh, uh, exoplanets had, had just uh, were a very, very new field when I when I wrote the first edition, uh, and especially when you consider that uh, that uh, uh, some of the things were written years before uh, the uh, the the uh, book actually went to press. Uh, but there's been a real explosion of new exoplanet results in the last ten years and new analysis techniques. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, we we didn't know much about what was in atmospheres when I wrote the first edition, but we have a whole new slew of tools and astronomical observations, uh, such as phase curve analysis, eclipse depth, tran transit depth spectroscopy, which I may tell a little bit about, uh, which which have come in that actually give us a, a very much more detailed window uh, on on what the what the planets are like and what their climates are 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 like. A lot of things that were just speculative when I wrote the book uh, are now actually ob observable. And of course, we know many, many, many more planets now than we did uh, than we did at the time the the book uh, I wrote the first edition. Uh, also, um, Pyth on the software front, Python is much further developed as a tool for scientific simulation. I was one of the early adopters of Python for science. But now it's become absolutely the standard language for planetary science, especially for uh, for exoplanets. Most of the tools uh, for analyzing exoplanet data uh, have been written in have been written in Python and various Python extensions. Uh, and, and something that's come along that I'll show you a bit of live uh, is the Jupyter Notebook interface, which provides a web-based interface to the Python language, allowing you to combine code that you can run and modify with explanatory material, including graphics and, and fully formatted equations and so forth. And I know a lot of you are probably doing distance learning. All of my lectures are online now at Oxford, and it looks like they will be for, uh, they, they will be for, um, for the Michaelmas term or fall term as well. So the the um, the uh, Jupyter notebook interface, which I'll be showing you uh, shortly, uh, is really ideal for distance learning. It provides a way to preserve some of the spontaneity you have in in-person lectures, uh, and also get the students involved with experimentation they can do themselves, either in the course of the lecture or or afterwards. Um, another uh, another uh, tip about distance learning, which I, if I have enough time, I, I may show you a bit, is that I found that, um, uh, well, I really like to lecture off of a blackboard or a whiteboard uh, and not just have canned lectures. And the, the Jupyter Notebooks do give you a lot of uh, you know, real-time ability to follow up student questions that, that emerge and do new calculations. But there's nothing that that really uh, is better than good old fashioned, you know, chalk and blackboard, which is something I, I very much miss uh, during um, uh, uh, during distance learning. But uh, in fact, I found that by using a drawing program like uh, Acrobat, uh, like uh, sorry, like uh, Illustrator, which is the one I tend to use, uh, you can have the equivalent of a kind of an infinite whiteboard uh, with a lot better graphic capabilities that I'm able to. To muster myself when just uh, drawing uh, free, drawing freehand, uh, and uh, I may show you a little bit about this, uh, about how that how that works. But it's a simple, it's a simple hack. But uh, I've I found it to be uh, be tremendously uh, tremendously useful. Um, okay, there have been many other new developments. Uh, there have been a lot of new developments, even in such basic things as atmospheric spectroscopy. How does uh, how does hydrogen uh, how does hydrogen absorb different colors of light? How strongly uh, uh, if hydrogen is colliding with carbon dioxide, uh, how does that affect the absorption of infrared light in the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect? Uh, and um, you know, many, many new things from from missions to Mars and uh, Venus solar system exploration. Uh, exciting things about about Pluto, which we have a good glimpse of for the first time, and revolutionized our conception of Pluto's atmosphere. Uh, but but uh, today, I'm just going to focus on exoplanets and uh, and also on the new courseware design. 
uh, uh, based around uh, the Jupyter notebook, uh, notebook interface. Let me just take a peek to see if there are any questions that have come out. Nope, no, uh, no uh, real-time questions yet, so I'll just keep on talking. Okay, so uh, you can actually get a, a good idea of the, uh, of, of the difference uh, of how far things have come along by comparing some of the plots that uh, that are in the uh, that are in the first edition uh, with uh, with plots um, with the the new plots I've made up for the second second edition. So so this is this is uh, from chapter one, the exoplanet section in the first edition, which went to press, which became available, came off the presses in in twenty in twenty ten, uh, and uh, and this is this is a. Um, uh, this is a, uh, let's see, I think this is, this is my, that's, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my uh, pen. Okay. Uh, by the way, just the annotation tools in, in, um, in your favorite PDF reader are also very useful for presentations. The, this, this is, um, uh, this is a, a version of what astronomers call a Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram. Uh, th this axis is basically how bright the star is. It's not how bright the star is uh, as seen from from uh, the solar system, but it's the intrinsic luminosity. It's it's the net power output of the star, uh, and um, uh, so it's uh, so this is this is the basically the brightness of the star corrected for the distance uh, from the solar system uh, in using ver using various methods, uh, and um, uh, so. Um, uh, is the, uh, in, a, in other words, you have to correct for the distance because uh, a bright object that's farther, far away will look dimmer than a rather dim object that happens to be close, close to us. Uh, so, so this is a measure of the property of the star. The, this, this horizontal axis uh, is, the, uh, is the effective stellar temperature, which is the temperature of the star. It's essentially the color of the star. So uh, you know from the phenomenon of red hot versus white hot and, and so forth that that uh, the higher the temperature, the more uh, sort of yellowish and bluish the color is, uh, and um, uh, and so um, uh, uh, the these stars with low surface temperatures uh, around three thousand degrees Kelvin, three thousand three thousand degrees above above absolute zero, uh, like around here. Uh, they're they are um, uh, they're reddish stars. Those are red dwarf stars. And for stars that get their energy by fusing hydrogen into helium, the the lower temperature stars are also smaller, and they're also dimmer. Uh, then the the sun is right around here. the The sun is 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 right around here. It's a it's a uh, called a G dwarf. These are the different spectral classes, uh, and. and uh, uh, our star is called a G dwarf star, main sequence star, getting its energy from hydrogen going into helium. And so, what I've plotted on this plot, uh, at, where uh, it, are, are all the stars about which a planet had been detected in 2010, and there are 200 and some dots there. So, so these this gives you the characteristic of the stars that that have planets around them, uh, and um, it's it's interesting that. Um, uh, that actually, if you just plot the same diagram for all stars, except for the fact that you have many more of them, uh, it, it lines up on this graph in pretty much the same way, uh, which means that actually the uh, uh, stars th that have planets are pretty much like any other star. You don't have to have a special kind of star to have a planet. Now, uh, watch this space here because there's a gap there uh, uh, which uh, uh, where, where there weren't any planets but that's just because. But that you'll see soon that that gap has been filled in. This line that that I've drawn here is called the main sequence, and there's a special relationship between luminosity and surface temperature, and also mass, uh, for um, for stars that are getting their energy by uh, by uh, fusing hydrogen into helium. And then this bit here, those are stars that have ended their main sequence lifetime. Uh, and they've basically run out of their ability to burn hydrogen fuel into helium, and they've become red giants. They, this is what's going to happen to our own sun uh, in about uh, in about uh, five billion more years. The the ultimate habit habitability crisis. Okay, so so these are the stars that have been found uh, that that have been found 
uh, up to up to 2010. These are the stars with planets that have been found up to 2010. And all of the almost all of these dots were found using a technique called radial velocity method, the radial velocity method. Uh, in which you look for the really subtle wobble of the star that's caused by the fact that it has a planet uh, orbiting around it. And so when the star is wobbling towards us, the light from that star is shifted a little bit towards the blue, just like when uh, the, a siren uh, of, a, of a police car or ambulance is coming toward you, the, the, the pitch is higher. When the star is going away, from us when it's wobbling away from us, it's shifted towards the red. And that the radio velocity method gives you an estimate of the mass of the planet. Uh, and uh, it was the workhorse, and it's still an important technique. But what came in uh, since, uh, in a big way since, since that time uh, was the transit method. Uh, when, when a star, when a planet passes in front of its star, uh, if the system is lined up right, it, it, uh, it blocks some of the starlight. And from detecting that very subtle dimming of the star, you can also tell whether there's a planet there. And it might seem like it was a kind of an unusual event for a uh, for uh, an orbit to be lined up just exactly such that this itty bitty planet uh, would cross in front of its star, because you have to be looking at the system almost edge on for that to happen. Systems have more or less random orientation, so only a small fraction of systems are actually transiting. Uh, but in fact, there are billions and billions of planets out there. And so even though it's only a small fraction of, of planets transit their star, that still adds up to thousands and thousands, in fact, billions and billions of planets or thousands and tens of thousands of planets that we can detect using the transit method. In fact, most of the new planets that have been detected are using the, tra are using the transit method. Uh, and so, so these are the dots. And I'll show you this in a way I can zoom in later. This is the same plot. Uh, th this is the same plot um, made as of 2019. I haven't updated it today, uh, but I'll show you some some code, uh, uh, in a, a notebook that allows you to actually make these plots uh, yourself. And so you can see there you have many more uh, many more dots here. There, in fact, there are about uh, 4,000 dots on this picture. It's it's, it's so it's so dense. Uh, it's so dense that in these clouds here, you can't really actually see how many dots there are. You can see that there's um, that this gap in the, in the intermediate temperature star has been filled in. We have a lot more uh, of the red giant stars filled in. We have some of the really hot stars. These are very short-lived stars that can only you know that that can only uh, live for a couple hundred million years uh, before uh, before they turn they turn into uh, red giants, uh, some of them a little bit to the left of this diagram actually turn into black holes or supernovas. And, and, uh, and you can you see we have many more planets down here in this low mass star, dim star, red dwarf, red dwarf regime, where you can actually see that uh, low mass stars have a different slope on the main sequence uh, in this kind of diagram than the higher mass stars. You can actually begin to pick up uh, a big enough population of those, of those stars. Um, uh, here, some key planet characteristics that I'll go go over uh, are the mass or the radius. In 2010, for the most part, we only knew the mass of stars, and we knew that rather imprecisely. Uh, but the transit method is sensitive not to the mass of the star, but to the size of the star. Because, sorry, not to the mass. We only knew the mass or the mass of the planet primarily, and not very precisely. But with the transit method, since the the uh, the bigger the planet is, the more starlight it blocks. The transit method also gives you the radius, uh, the radius of the star. Uh, sorry, the radius of the planet. Pardon me. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, it, in the lucky situation where you have both of those things, you can actually get the density of the planet because if you know the volume and the mass, you know the density. So you know something about what it's made out of because iron is a lot more dense than ice, water ice, for example, or hydrogen. So and now the, and another major characteristic. Uh, is what I call the installation. That there wasn't really a good name for this thing in in uh, 2010, but it's it's a generalization of what we call the solar constant uh, for for Earth. It's how much uh, radiation from the star uh, is in incident on your planet from uh, uh, as as measured in outer space uh, at the orbit of your at the actual orbit of your planet and the installation can be represented by the the uh, luminosity uh, represented in terms of the luminosity which was in the uh, 
uh, which, which was in the uh, previous diagram, uh, divided by basically the square of the distance of the planet from the star. Uh, that's the inverse square law. And if you actually write that in terms of units of the solar luminosity, and if uh, then the, the luminosity, uh, the, the installation relative to Earth, Earth's installation uh, is the uh, uh, is the the ratio of the uh, solar uh, luminosity uh, to um, uh, to the square of the distance of the orbit uh, measured in astronomical units. If you if you divide uh, both sides by the solar luminosity, then the relative installation uh, it, it just goes uh, uh, can be computed uh, very very readily. And when the relative installation is one, that means that the planet uh, is getting the same amount of stellar energy from its star as the Earth is getting from the sun. And so all other things being equal, and that's a big if. But the, but the same kind of atmosphere, uh, the the planet would have the same temperature as the Earth, and so um, and so that's what I called stellar flux in 2010. Uh, uh, so this is a, a a plot where I put the the stellar flux, and one is is the uh, is when the uh, installation is uh, is uh, equal to Earth's installation, and all other things being equal would give you an Earth like uh, Earth like climate. The vertical axis is the mass in, in units of Jupiter. So Jupiter actually is somewhere around here. Uh, Jupiter is somewhere around there because it um, it's far out from the sun and doesn't get much installation. So it's a fairly cold place in its upper atmosphere. Sorry, sorry, Jupiter is around there, one Jupiter mass. But uh, Earth is Earth-like planets are down towards the bottom of this, uh, you know, uh, on the order of a percent of a Jupiter mass or what have you. So. Uh, uh, now, low, high mass planets uh, like the mass of Jupiter are likely to made be gas giants and have no surface to stand on made of primarily hydrogen. It's down here in this region uh, of lower mass things uh, that uh, that things have a chance uh, that plants have a chance to be rocky and be more be more Earth like. You can see there's some already there are some extremely hot planets getting a thousand times as much stellar energy as the Earth. But now, if we look at uh, the, uh, I'll just make this bigger. So you can actually see this. Uh, this this is the um, uh, this this is the um, th this is the the um, equivalent plot uh, using uh, data I downloaded at the end of at the end of 2019. Uh, and um, uh, the circles are actually low mass stars. Those are those are M star. Those are the uh, the M M stars. And uh, uh, and um, uh, they're especially interesting because M stars, low mass stars, are by far the most common kind of star in the universe. In fact, they're so common and they so commonly have planets. People ask the question, why aren't we around, uh, uh, living around an M star? Why are we around a G star, which is a lot less common? Is there something special about G stars? Uh, there might be. That's something I discussed in the book. Uh, but uh, but uh, if you just had to pick... A, a, a planet at random in the universe, probably it would be a planet around an M star. So, uh, so it's a question, you know, uh, are we just, is it just chance that we, that our star is a G star or uh, that the sun's a G star or is there something else going on there? But anyway, so, so now we have many, many more, uh, many, many more stars, these, the uh, many more and more planets. Uh, and in particular, uh, we're, we're starting to f uh, get a good population uh, of planets down in this uh, in this range where uh, where uh, they're getting the same amount of stellar radiation from the Earth from this from their star as the Earth gets from the Sun, so they could have an Earth-like temperature, and also they have a mass that is comparable to the Earth, so they're more likely to be rocky. But there are also things that are roughly twice the Earth uh, twice the Earth's mass, which have no which also could be rocky, but have no counterpart. Uh, in the uh, in the solar system, and if I go over, this is something data we didn't have in 2010. Uh, this is the same kind of plot, but with the pl planets uh, for which we have a radius uh, relative to the Jupiter radius uh, by the by the transit method. And you can see there's this something that is is new is there's this kind of radius gap that uh, that that separates this this cloud of things from uh, these hot gassy planet sort of things. Uh, and uh, it's one of the active subjects of research, you know, just what is actually accounting for that radius gap. 
Okay. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to cut over to uh, a Python notebook showing you how to actually make, uh, that allow you to make these kinds of plots um, your, yourself. Let me just get back to uh, normal size there. Uh, but I just want, want to highlight a few systems that have been spectacular uh, planets that have been discovered and planetary systems that have been discovered uh, since the first edition. Uh, and that give us a whole lot of things to, uh, to, to think about. So one of them is the TRAPPIST-1 system. This is a, 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 a system, a planetary system with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's, it's actually named after the TRAPPIST beer. Uh, it, was, uh, it was discovered by a Belgian team. Belgian team. TRAPPIST-1 is a very low mass star. It's about as small as a star can be and actually be a star, a legitimate star in the sense that it fuses hydrogen into helium. It's dim. Uh, so in order for a planet to be warm enough to have liquid water and support Earth-like life, uh, the, star, the planets have to be very close. In fact, all of these planets are extremely close to their star. It's an extremely compact system. Uh, the, uh, the, the, if you squeezed this, the, the orbits of the TRAPPIST-1 system into the solar system, this is the solar system down below. Mercury is our closest planet in the solar system. This little disk in here uh, is, 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 how, is what the TRAPPIST-1 system would look like. But these planets are not all fried uh, because, uh, because, in fact, the star is very, very dim. It's only about 1% of the power output of the sun. So, in fact, this system is extremely exciting because three of the planets, D, E, and F. So, sometimes I think we should we should name we should you know fund our research by selling naming rights to planets. But uh, uh, our planets have very unprosaic names like Trappist One D, Trappist One E, and Trappist One F. These three are in the so-called habitable zone, uh, where uh, where liquid water could be stable on the surface if the planet has the right kind of atmosphere. We don't yet know whether these planets have any atmospheres at all. That's, that, these are artists' conceptions of the planets. Uh, but we will know uh, something about that when the James Webb Space Telescope flies, which, which knock wood, I'm knocking wood on my desk here, knock wood uh, will be within a year or two. Okay. Um, another class of planets uh, uh, which uh, has, has been populated, has come into the fore uh, since the first edition are lava planets. These are rocky planets in very short period orbits uh, around the star. So this is the, for example, uh, 55 Cancri E, which is a, a um, star, a, a very bright star in the constellation of Cancer, Cancer of the Crab. Uh, it, it is, it's orbiting a, a star as bright as the sun, but its orbit is so close it's, it, that its year is just three quarters of an Earth day. Uh, and, uh, and at that distance, uh, the the day side of the planet, uh, the the day side of the planet, the place where the sun is beating beating straight down, uh, is um, uh, is so hot it melts rock. So so these planets have a permanent lava ocean on the day side. Now I should mention uh, planets that are orbit very close to their stars are very different from Earth. The Earth has a high rate of spin, so the sun rises and sets. Uh, on close orbit planets, the tidal stresses flexing the rock actually spin down the planet until its length of day equals its length of year. And the planet becomes tide locked to the star in the same way and presents the same face to the star all the time, the way the moon always presents the same face to the Earth. Uh, and uh, that means that it, 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 there's a night side where it's just nighttime all the time and never gets any stellar radiation. And there's a day side where, where the sun is in a fixed position in the sky all the time. Uh, the temperatures here are on the order of 2,000 to 3,000 Kelvin, and that's hot enough to melt essentially any kind of rock. So these plants have a really fascinating climate. It, it opens up the whole new field of magma oceanography. What happens, how do the currents flow in a magma ocean that freezes out towards the edge, but also magma oceans uh, put out gases like sodium vapor and silicon monoxide, which then uh, flow from the day side to the night side uh, and then uh, condense out there into, uh, into uh, rain of quartz and rain of liquid sodium. Fascinating sort of planet and a whole new, uh, a, a whole new uh, field of endeavor for thinking about planetary climate. Okay. 
so now I'm going to go over to my, uh, oh, actually, uh, I'm going to um, uh, unshare that screen. And I'm going to actually uh, share my uh, main screen uh, so you can see my see my notebook. Okay, so now you're you're going. Okay, so uh, uh, so there we go. So now, um, no, okay. Uh, so this is you're what you're looking at now. Uh, what you're looking at now. What you yep looks like it's you're actually looking at that uh, is is a Jupiter notebook. Uh, it, it, you access these things uh, just through an ordinary web browser. So a, a student doesn't have to know anything uh, about uh, how to log into a system or whatever. Uh, you access Python uh, right through directly through a web browser, and the instructor can even set up uh, a remote uh, a remote uh, notebook server on a central computer. So the students don't actually even have to go into a lab and uh, and run this software on some special machine. Uh, they can just sit at their own laptop uh, without having to install any software whatsoever and do everything that I'm that I'm uh, showing you uh, that I'm showing you right here. Um, so I, actually, while I'm while I'm at it, I'm just going to actually uh, do my little Adobe Illustrator thing, uh, just to uh, just to uh, give you an indication uh, to explain what uh, the transit method. Uh, just in, in a sketch, and so I'm going to make a plot. So I'm just using the brush brush tool here for a plot. And so this is this is time on the horizontal axis, and, and the vertical axis uh, is is uh, is is basically the brightness of the combined okay. If you like, you can also type these things in. Uh, it's, it's that's the brightness. Uh, Uh, that that's that's the that's the, the vertical axis is the is the brightness um, as seen by a telescope uh, on Earth uh, observing the combined light from the star and the planet. So this 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 little guy here, this little blue blue planet, uh, is um, is orbiting the star. So it'll go uh, it'll go across the face of the star and. Um, and then it will. Uh, Go behind the star. I'm using my uh, layering so I can show it going behind the star. It goes behind the star, and it comes out the other side, and it will orbit around. Uh, it'll orbit around again. Okay. So now, um, when 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 the when the um, when the planet uh, is not blocking the starlight, you see the combined light of the star and the planet is, is pretty high. So it's like that. But then once you see the um, the the planet you know cross the star the star uh, the front of the star the starlight dips and so you see this abrupt dip and the depth of that dip tells you how big the planet is relative to the star and so now the planet will then you know go across uh, and then um, uh, and then now it, it's 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 not blocking the starlight anymore so the uh, uh, it, it goes up. Now, actually, this this is the same method that gives us a way of uh, that gives us a way of saying something about what's in the atmosphere, because the the planet looks bigger at certain colors of light than other colors of light, because some, because some gases are more opaque than others, and, and then block light further up in the atmosphere than the other uh, than at others. So this whole new method of transit depth spectroscopy is a whole way we know something about what's in the what's in the atmospheres. But but the secondary eclipse, when the planet goes behind the star, so I'm going to just do my secondary eclipse. Okay, when the planet goes behind the star, I'm going to actually modify uh, modify my sketch a little bit. Okay, uh, when the right before the planet goes behind the star, in fact. Uh, you know, I should actually, I'll make this, uh, uh, I should put another bump over there, but I won't. Uh, right before the planet goes behind the star, actually, I'll exaggerate this bump. Right before the planet goes behind the star, 
uh, you're looking at the planet from the day side on. You're looking at it face on from the hottest side. So you're seeing the emission, the light that's emitted plus reflected uh, from the day side of the planet. But the minute the, when the planet goes behind the star, that emission is blocked because the star, the star cuts it off. And so you get another little dip, which, which, which represents, uh, which, which represents uh, the amount of emission from the planet that is blocked uh, when the planet goes behind the star. And of course, it then comes back, uh, emission comes back when the planet emerges from the other side of the star. But by looking at how deep this dip is down there, you can tell what the temperature of the day side of the planet is because hotter, the hotter something is, the more it radiates. Similarly, you can tell things about what's in the atmosphere because some gases radiate energy better, better than other gases. Um, so, um, uh, so there's just a wealth of information that comes from this new, uh, uh, this, this new uh, transit method, which, which was just barely coming onto the scene uh, when I, uh, uh, when I, uh, when I wrote the first edition, but, uh, the, the, uh, second edition will explain how you use all of these new techniques to characterize, uh, what's in atmospheres and so forth. It's a very natural application. Uh, it's a very natural application of the, uh, radiative transfer stuff that I do. Okay. So now back to, back to this notebook. Okay. So here, here is, here is the, here's the notebook. Uh, you, you can put text, in into the into the cells of the notebook, you can put links. Uh, you can put links in. So here I have a description of where to get new exoplanet data, uh, and these are live links. If I if I then just mouse that, you go directly to the source of the data, uh, and uh, you can actually you can. This is data anybody can get. You can get it as well as I can, and uh, the data just gets downloaded through this convenient uh, tabular interface. Which uh, which you can then download into uh, into spreadsheet spreadsheet data. Uh, it's getting and this is current as of today. Uh, you can search by the name of star by uh, uh, of the planet and what what characteristics. It's got every characteristic you could want for for doing climate calculations. Okay, so the, um, uh, and uh, and there are descriptions here. And I've written this to work with several different exoplanet ar archives. Okay, and now you can uh, other cells. Can uh, uh, other cells can uh, can have Python code in them? This is this is Python code, and so when I hit this run, uh, it actually runs that code. So here I, I set some constants that I need. I'm not going to go through this line by line. There are various uh, routines that are needed to read in the data, uh, and I use Python uh, constructions like dictionaries. Uh, to make it easy to organize the data. So this is like a whole lesson in how to use Python for uh, for uh, scientific simulation. Here I'm actually reading in the data from disk uh, and um, and scroll down some more. Okay. Uh, and so, um, okay. Now I've just actually finished reading in the, uh, I finished reading in the data from the entire, from the entire NASA exoplanet Catalog. I didn't uh, download today's uh, today's version yet, uh, uh, and so now if you now uh, if you want to make plots, uh, uh, actually I'll, I'll um, let me uh, get rid of my uh, uh, output uh, so that you can actually see this plot coming in. So this this um, so there's a uh, you can you can make plots and show them uh, in line. So this is a plot. This remakes that plot of that general that Hertzsprung and Russell diagram. Uh, that I showed you, that I showed you from the uh, from the uh, just the static figure in the book. But now this has been made in real time, so that inevitably there will be thousands of new planets uh, discovered between the time the book goes to second edition goes to press uh, and the time you know a reader is looking at the book. So there were 3,900 planets roughly at the time uh, this this plot was made. Uh, there are some that have been discovered around really really hot stars over there. Uh, these these graphs uh, are are live, and so I can actually, if I want to just zoom in, if I want to just zoom in on something like the um, region that I uh, that I had before, uh, this is it. Now, if I actually want to look in this region, which is uh, which is around the uh, G-type stars, sun-like stars, I have a lot of stuff running in the background, so my uh, my uh, little 
uh, cursor tracking is a little bit slowed down. Okay, so it's uh, uh, so I've zoomed in there, so now I can actually start to see the individual dots uh, in that in in that, and so uh, so uh, so now. Uh, uh, now I actually can, can remake those mass and radius scatter plots. So sorry, those mass and radius scatter plots that show you the um, uh, uh, scatter plot of the installation. Again, this this one down here, ten to the zero. The Earth-like installation is right around there. That we give you an Earth-like climate. This is roughly uh, habitable. There are a cluster of, of habitable zone planets that could have liquid water stably uh, stably on the planet. Uh, and the uh, and then here here you see your your gap your 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 gap your radius gap between the hot Jupiters and these uh, more Uranus and Neptune sized things and the green things are are M stars and so by simple modifications uh, of the code that was in the previous in the cell that made this plot if you actually wanted to to um, filter it a different way and just plot planets that had uh, and just plot planets that. Um, uh, that were around G stars, sun-like stars. Instead, you can do that. You can make all sorts of subsets you, very simply in a line or two of modification of the previous code. But most importantly, you can just download today's data uh, and see see what the latest news is about about the exoplanets. Um, uh, now uh, you can and um, uh, yeah, and so we have both the the, uh, the planetary radius plot and the uh, and the planetary mass plot. Uh, the uh, over over there. Okay, okay. So um, okay. Now, actually, this is something I didn't. Uh, that is also in the sec going to be in the second edition. But it's the kind of plot that we couldn't make at the time of the first edition. So for about eight hundred planets, we have measurements of both the mass and the radius. And so uh, so here I've plotted the radius on the horizontal axis and the mass on the vertical axis. So this is Jupiter mass, uh, and this is Jupiter radius over there. Uh, and and um, so higher density planets, so planets up in this cluster have a density that's similar to solid iron. Uh, planets uh, around here, by around the green line, have a density that you would expect if you squeeze hydrogen uh, down to the to the pressures you get in the interiors of these big planets. You can see that in these in these in, in some of these planets, big planets, the density is really uh, the, can be really quite high. Uh, and some other ones, the density is extremely low. And some of these are actually some of these planets have such low density, much lower density than Jupiter. Um, uh, in other words, they're puffier and lower density than they should be by our standard planetary theory. So something is inflating them. Their interiors are hotter than we think they should they should be based on standard theories. Okay, th this red line is roughly the line of density of what we call commonly call rock on Earth, and so now you can see see that there are when you can actually spot from this you know where where the rocky planets are, and so again you, you, if you want to actually plot just the the uh, low mass uh, stars on this uh, on this you can do, you can do that. Okay. Uh, just freeze that graph and okay and now um, if I, I want to uh, skip ahead uh, the last thing I'll say I'm actually running short on on time uh, I want to leave time for questions the last thing I want to just uh, show you is is where some of these planets are in the sky uh, and um, I don't expect you to be able to read the coordinates here but this is uh, this is uh, the a map of the celestial sphere uh, th this is um, this is one of the coordinates that astronomers use to say where things are in the sky. It's really as if you took the the all the stars and constellations and you projected them onto the surface of the Earth and made a globe, and uh, that you're looking at from the top. Uh, and um, actually, this is uh, flipped around left and right, so it's as if you're lying on your back on the Earth and looking at the at the sky as if all of the planets were uh, and stars were painted onto. A big sphere uh, uh, on the sky, and so this is the. Uh, but this is in a coordinate system that is convenient for those of us living on the surface of Earth instead of living in, on space telescopes. This is the this is the equator, which is the Earth's equator uh, projected out onto the celestial sphere. Um, 
Uh, and so one way of thinking about it is if you're at 45 degrees latitude, which is around here, and you're lying on your back, as, as time goes on uh, and you're looking straight up, the constellations you see straight overhead float past you to uh, more or less where my cursor is floating past. Okay, and so this is Cygnus is over here. Uh, Ursa Major, the Great Bear is around here. The Pole Star is somewhere around there. Uh, this curvy line here, uh, is is the uh, is the uh, is the Milky Way galaxy, which is not lined up with the Earth's equator, uh, so it comes out as this funny bendy thing. Okay, so so that's the basic celestial coordinate system uh, that is used that tells you how you point telescopes if you're sitting on Earth. This is a slight, this one you can uh, read the latitude and longitude coordinates, and this just shows you. Um, this is a map that was made uh, by the Arecibo uh, group. Uh, showing you where various planets are, and there's a whole bunch uh, that is is bunched up right here, and I'll show you why pretty soon. Gives you an idea of where where uh, habitable zone planets, planets that could have liquid water in, on the surface, have been discovered. Now, I did, this is a fancy graph, but my so software uh, <clears throat> allows you to uh, uh, to make plots like that yourself. And uh, if I'll just I'll just sort of uh, put this more on an aspect ratio. That is uh, that is um, you know more like that uh, that graph, okay. Um, you see this little bunch. So this this is these this is from the NASA Exoplanet Catalog. And again, if you want, you can filter this data set. Uh, you can filter this data set according to distance, type of star. You see a big cluster here, and you see a uh, and you see a whole bunch of uh, little. Uh, clusters there. That actually comes from the, Ske the Kepler Space Telescope. Uh, and in fact, if I redo that plot, if I if I redo that plot with higher resolution, it makes the dots smaller, but you can see what's going on better. So I'll, and I'll just rerun that. Okay, you see this funny thing. There's this. Is it, what is this? It looks like a kite. Uh, there's this. Uh, there's this funny little bunch of squares. And that's not uh, that's not an error in my graphics. That's a real thing. Uh, that's uh, if you look at the uh, detector of the Kepler Space Telescope. Those are the individual uh, charge coupled devices, the the light detectors uh, that are in the telescope itself. And the telescope focuses the field of stars onto that. And each yellow dot here uh, represents. Uh, a star that has a planet around it. And so just in this tiny little field of few that Kepler was looking at, uh, you have uh, thousands of uh, thousands of planets. Imagine what it's going to be like when we're able to look at the whole sky, which the test space telescope is. Now these other little clusters here, that was from after the Kepler space telescope broke, it, uh, one of its pointing wheels broke. Uh, and so I couldn't point at that little part of the sky anymore. Instead, it was looking at all different parts of the sky. And uh, these are from the different stairs from the K2 mission. Okay, so now uh, there is a lot more I could show you uh, with Jupyter Notebooks, but uh, we're five minutes before the nominal end, and I do want to leave time for questions. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop talking here, and, uh, and then we, I will, um, I, I will uh, go to the, uh, go see if we have questions. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so I have a question from uh, uh, Jonas uh, Hesseman. Could uh, uh, could a planet be also cloudy and uh, and, and not hot? I'm I'm not sure exactly which planet, but uh, you can have clouds. Um, uh, you can have clouds in very cold planets. In fact, uh, the Earth accounts as a cold planet, or for that matter, Titan uh, is a, is a very cold uh, a satellite, and it has methane clouds. Uh, and so. Um, and so you can have clouds in, in anything from an extremely hot planet, like a lava planet, down to an extremely cold planet. But the cold planets are actually harder to observe, and so we don't have much data. Uh, we don't have much data uh, from uh, from the very cold planets yet. That will that will be coming later. Um, I do have a question about uh, methane. Okay, yes. Why are amateurs? Um, Oh, actually, amateur. That's uh, it's not, it's not true. Uh, it's not really true that amateur scientists are more accepted in astrophysics uh, than climate science. Uh, I mean, there's actually quite a lot of uh, there's actually quite a lot of citizen science done in, cli in climate. Uh, the phenomenon in climate science, though, is that a lot of so-called citizen science 
you know, has been really sloppy science, not citizen science. Citizen science can be very good, but uh, but some people with a political agenda to try to so-called disprove global warming uh have you know have have uh, been making a lot of uh a lot of onerous data requests and uh, uh that scientists have hard time keeping up with and then just raising spurious questions that that uh, uh that just try to confuse the issue rather than doing honest science but but the data is almost completely open from climate modeling and so forth there's a lot of open source code um, but uh, unfortunately, some some uses of citizen science and climate science has has um, has has uh, given it a bad name. Okay, so Jonas has another question. Um, uh, actually, I, no questions are really off topic. The book actually I've focused on exoplanets, but but the the book also covers global warming and things like that as well. Um, uh, regarding the exo, okay, what was the question about exoplanets? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, the the most exciting thing from JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, is that uh, is that we will be able to tell whether uh, planets around M stars have atmospheres at all, because planets without an atmosphere have a very rocky planets without an atmosphere has a very distinct signature. So right now, we know although those nice Trappist one planets are potentially habitable, but we don't actually know if any of them have atmospheres. James Webb will tell us about those atmospheres. Uh, there also is the possibility that we'll be de detecting some kind of biomarkers uh, like like oxygen. Uh, this is still not easy with James Webb. Uh, uh, it will be, biomarkers will be at the sort of margins of what James Webb may be able to do. Uh, and the follow-on telescopes will be able to do that better. But we'll, we'll have a big leap in understanding, uh, we'll have a big leap in our understanding of which, which rocky planets have atmospheres, and that will be a, a huge step forward. Okay, yes, now this is an interesting question. Uh, the, the global warming potentials or the, the global warming effect of methane versus carbon dioxide. And so, you know, uh, uh, so, um, uh, Methane has a lower molecular weight uh, than carbon dioxide, uh, and so there are more molecules of methane in a ton of methane uh, than there are in a ton of carbon dioxide. But but some molecules are much better at absorbing uh, infrared radiation, which is and it's infrared absorption that gives you the greenhouse effect. Some molecules are much better than others other molecules at absorbing infrared radiation, and so the number of molecules itself does not give you uh, uh, an intrinsic measure of how strong the greenhouse effect is. Um, uh, for example, uh, most of the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen, which do almost nothing to infrared. They're almost completely transparent to infrared. Uh, but the, the main uh, infrared opacity in the Earth's atmosphere, the main thing that absorbs infrared is carbon dioxide and water vapor. And water vapor is more of a feedback than something that responds to what we admit because it rains out and uh, it's not limited by the source of water, but uh, uh, but by how warm the temperature is. So um, uh, so um, really looking at the count of molecules isn't the rel isn't the relevant thing. The reason that actually one molecule of methane absorbs more infrared radiation than one molecule of CO2, which is a more interesting thing to think about, is that right now methane absorbs infrared radiation of a color or part of the spectrum that is uh, where CO2 and water vapor don't absorb very well. And we don't have much methane in the atmosphere, so adding one more molecule of methane to the atmosphere actually gives you uh, more of a punch in the greenhouse effect than one molecule of carbon dioxide. Uh, nonetheless, actually, uh, the, methane effect, uh, uh, the uh, methane effect on global warming is, is somewhat overrated uh, because uh, the way people express that effect doesn't take into account adequately the fact that methane disappears from the atmosphere in just 12 years. So it doesn't stick around for a long time, whereas carbon dioxide produces essentially irreversible effects on climate. But, but the basic physics of methane versus CO2, that's discussed in the book. And the same physics we use to think about these things in the context of global warming is the physics we use to understand the climate of Titan or the climate of hot Jupiters. 
So I think that's a good time, place to wrap up. Thanks for sticking st sticking around. Uh, this will be recorded. And of course, I love to answer questions. And if you have any other questions uh, that occur to you later about distance learning, if you want to know about uh, other features of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, like how, how it can display equations and so forth, uh, just just write to me. Just uh, send me an email. I'll be very happy to, to answer that. So thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful talking to you. and. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, when uh, people can get together in person again, because I would love to do an in-person book tour when the second, uh, second edition comes out. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye.